as I often do uh, for our message on Sunday morning. Has anybody noticed today that people want all the benefits of hard work and sacrifice without hard work and sacrifice? Anybody ever notice that? Um, I was, <laughs> this was kind of interesting to me as I was reading it this week. The, I think it's pronounced Bridger Wilderness Area. Anybody familiar with that? Some of you that have been out west? Well, the Bridger Wilderness Area is in the Bridger Tent National Forest in Wyoming. And it promises beautiful lakes, the highest mountain peak in the state of Wyoming, and 600 miles of hiking trails up and around the uh, Wind River mountain ranges. There's a little doubt in my mind from what I read about it that there's some beautiful sights and views for those that are willing to put in the hard work and the effort to hike those trails and to see those things. The area is always trying to improve and make it better, so like a lot of places, they put a suggestion box. And I was kind of laughing this week as I read some of the suggestions that were made to this wilderness area. And here's some of those suggestions. Trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. <laughs> it's a mountain wilderness area. Another suggestion. Too many bugs, leeches, spiders, and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the areas of these pests. Another suggestion. Please pave the trails. Chairlifts need to be in some places so that we can get to the wonderful views without having to hike to them. Here's the one I thought was funny. A small deer came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. <laughs> Is there any way I can be reimbursed? <laughs> Two more. One suggestion was this. Escalators would help on the steep uphill sections. And then the last one. Too many rocks in the mountains. <laughs> now, be mindful of something. Those suggestions were not made by people who could not hike up the hills. They were made by people that didn't want to hike the hills, but wanted the benefits of the beauty and everything that was there without putting in the effort to get it. Uh, and so again, there were those that wanted the benefits without the work and without the sacrifice. Unfortunately, the same mentality carries into people's lives. The same mentality carries into people's lives. People today want high-paying jobs without responsibility. People today want all of the comforts and the luxuries of life without having to pay for them or work for them. People regularly look at people who put in lots of hours and lots of sacrifice to earn what they have and then sit back and cry, that's not fair. They have all of these things that I don't. Now, they may work 70 hours a week to get it, and I don't, but they miss that. And so again, people want the benefits of hard work and the benefits of sacrifice without hard work and without sacrifice. One of the things that I fear in churches today is that the same mentality bleeds its way or finds its way into the church. People join churches and claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. And when all of the perceived benefits of, that, that come along with that, without any sacrifice and without any effort. And, and I think that we see that not only outside of the church, we see that inside the church as well. How many people today join churches and want the assurance of going to heaven with no change in their life at all? How many people today want the encouragement of belonging to a local body of Christ without giving anything in return? They want all the benefits of being a part of a church. They want encouragement and they want support. And, and, and you should expect all of those things from a church that you belong to. But they want all of these things without giving any of those things. And without doing anything toward others. They want the benefits themselves. Many want the status of being recognized as a Christian without putting Christ first in their lives at all. And, and I don't think that as I say that this morning that that's something new. 
It may be growing and it may not be growing. It may be getting more prevalent and it may not. It all depends on your perspective of those things. But I believe in our text today, in Luke chapter 14, that Jesus dealt with the same mentality. He dealt with the same ideas. If you read in verse 25, it says, Now great multitudes went with Jesus. And he turned around and he said to them, and we talked a few weeks ago in one of our other messages that, you know, everywhere that Jesus went, crowds followed. You know, it was rare to see Jesus going anywhere by himself. There were almost always a crowd of people that, that followed him. And, and there were times that he fought to get away from that. But here there are, again, crowds of people, multitudes of people that are following Jesus Christ. And they're following Jesus for a variety of reasons. They're following Jesus because they like to listen to him teach. You know, every time Jesus taught, there were people that said, well, nobody's ever taught like this. They, they wanted to hear him teach. There were those that followed because they wanted to see him do miracles. Jesus did a lot of amazing things. And there were people that wanted to see those things and, and be a part of those things. Certainly there were those that were following Jesus to see what they could get from Jesus. And Jesus pointed that out. In another setting to another crowd, he said, you know, you're only following me to get what you can and to see how you can benefit from, from following me. And so here is another crowd in Luke 14 that's following Jesus. And, and certainly as they're following Jesus, I don't know how else to describe it other, other than to say that they were casual followers of Jesus. They weren't committed followers of Jesus. They weren't antagonistic, not this crowd, there were other crowds that were, but this crowd wasn't necessarily antagonistic to Jesus. They didn't necessarily argue with his teaching, not this crowd. They were following, they were listening, and, and I suppose that if you were to go to the crowd and to say to them, now, how many of you are followers of Jesus? Probably a large number of them, if not all of them, would raise their hand and say, oh, I'm a follower of, of Jesus Christ. And yet, Jesus looks at them, he turns to them in verse 25, and he begins to speak to them. And he shares with them what I consider to be a very hard message. And yet it's a message about who is a true follower of Jesus Christ, and who's not. And, and so really, the, the answer to that, or the outcome of that, our response to, to the message that Jesus is going to preach here is vitally important. Because today it's important for us as well to realize, or to answer the question, am I a true follower of Jesus Christ, or am I just a casual follower of Jesus Christ? Am I a follower of Christ in name only, or does my life demonstrate that I am a true follower of Christ? As I thought about that this week, I thought, you know, being a follower of Christ <coughs> means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Some would say that following Christ means that I have said a prayer. At some point in my life, I said a prayer, and now I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Others would say that being a follower of Jesus Christ means I go to church on a regular basis. And you know, almost every Sunday I'm in church, and therefore I'm a follower of Christ. Some would define it that way. Some believe that a follower of Christ is somebody that believes that God or Jesus exists. And it amazes me and saddens me over the years how many people have said, well, you know, I mean I go to church, but I'm, I'm a follower of God because I believe that he exists. That's how they define it. Of course, I always tell them that Satan believes God exists too. And he's not a follower of Christ. But, but there are many that would say that. There are others that would say being a follower of Christ simply means doing the best you can. Do the best you can. Now, all of us need to do the best that we can. There's no question about that. That doesn't make us a follower of Christ. But that's how different ones define it. Jesus, in our text today, says that teaches us what following Him really means. And, and, and if nothing else, we can sum up what He says here by saying this. Being a follower or a disciple, and I'm going to use those two words interchangeably, I believe they mean the same thing here. A follower or a disciple of Christ means this, according to Jesus. Being committed to Him 
above everything else in our lives. A true follower of Jesus Christ, according to Jesus and according to what he is saying here, is somebody that is committed to him above everything else in their lives. Putting Jesus Christ first in everything. Now if you notice in verse 26, Jesus begins his, his uh, message here, or his lesson here, by saying, If anyone, if anyone comes to me and does not, and he goes on, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, lists a number of things. Jesus is speaking here to anyone who desires to be a follower of his. Anyone who wants to be a follower of Christ, Jesus is going to say that these things must apply to that person's life. There's no exceptions, there's no excuses, and not everybody is going to be a follower of Christ. That's what really Jesus is saying here. A follower of Christ is someone, anyone, who is committed to Jesus Christ above all else. And then Jesus goes on and he says this. If anyone comes after me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, at that point, or at this point in the message, probably the hairs on the back of your neck will stand up. If you had some. <laughs> because we don't like that statement. We don't like that statement. It kind of flies in the face of, of, of what we think. Where Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you need to hate your father and your mother and your wife and your children and your parents. And we, we struggle with that. And what Jesus said here certainly seems harsh. And, and probably it leads us, in our minds at least, to ask, how could Jesus say that? I mean, what does he mean? And as, I, as we read that, it's important for us to, to understand that Jesus is not here literally saying, hate your father and your mother and your wife and your children. He's not literally saying, hate your family members. If he did, it's in direct contrast to what he's taught elsewhere. Because in other places, we're taught to love our families. And we're taught to, to love those around us. And so Jesus certainly is not here saying, you need to hate them. You need to push them aside and, and, and forget about them. That would be contradictory to what Jesus taught elsewhere. <coughs> Jesus is speaking here uh, probably what we would call, um, uh, I forgot the word, hyperbole. Um, he's exaggerating here. He, he's exaggerating. And he's, he's exaggerating to make a serious point. What Jesus is saying is that if we, if we want to be his disciples, that he needs to be first in our lives. He needs to come before everything else. Now, it's not a matter of our feelings. You know, we think hate and we think love and we think emotions and we think feelings. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about commitment. Jesus is saying, a disciple of mine is somebody that's going to be committed to me, that's going to put me first in everything that they do. He's going to put me ahead of his family. He's going to put me ahead of his brothers and sisters. He's going to put me ahead of everything else. Now understand, that when Christ is first in our lives, everybody else comes to a higher place in our lives, not a lower place in our lives. If I put, and I'm going to get sidetracked in here, if I put Jesus Christ first in my life, I'm going to love my wife more than I ever did if Jesus wasn't first in my life. If Jesus is first in my life, I'm going to love my kids and my brothers and my sisters far greater than I would ever love them if Jesus was not first in my life. And so don't get the impression here that, that we need to, to push our family aside and not love them. 
If Jesus is first in our lives and we're truly disciples of Christ, everybody else in our lives is going to be higher in our lives, not lower. And, and so Jesus is making a point here and saying, you need to be committed to me. I need to be first in your life. As I thought about that this week, I was thinking about Mark chapter 10. And it's not really a related passage of scripture, but I think it, it helps us to understand here what he's saying. In Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 6, Jesus said, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And then he says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, as I thought about that, I thought, is Jesus here saying when a, when a couple gets married, they need to just leave their parents and put them behind and never think about them again? Certainly that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, when a husband gets married, his wife needs to be first in his life, not his parents anymore. His wife needs to be his priority, and he needs to be committed to her above everything else. And you know, that's exactly what Jesus is saying about being his disciple. If, if, if we are a follower or a true disciple of Jesus Christ, he needs to have the priority in our lives. He needs to be ahead of everybody else in our lives. And then he goes on, and I think he makes it even harder. Because he says this about husbands and wives and children and brothers and sisters. And then he says at the end of verse 26, yes, and his own life also. Jesus said, if you are going to be my disciple, I need to be first over everybody else in your life. <coughs> But I also need to be first in your life. I need to be over your life, over who you are, over your wants and your goals and your desires and your plans. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, I have to be first in your life. I have to take priority over everything and everyone in your life. You may realize it already without me saying it, but if that's true in our lives, that's going to cost us something. That's going to cost us something. You see, being a true disciple of Jesus Christ doesn't come without cost. It doesn't come without sacrifice. We can't put somebody else first in our lives without sacrificing of ourselves. And so Jesus goes on here, and he says in verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now those again, those are some pretty strong words. Jesus said, if you're not willing to bear your cross, if you're not willing to sacrifice, you can't be my disciple. Now those are tough, tough words. They're tough things. Now we understand to some degree what it means to, to bear a cross. We understand to some degree what it means to bear a cross, although I, I'm sure that those that were listening to Jesus understood it much better than we do. Because those that were criminals, that were tried and found guilty uh, under certain terms, in, in Jesus' day were crucified. And, and I'm not going to go into the details of that because we're familiar with that. But a convicted criminal on his way to be crucified, had to bear his cross. He had to put that cross on his back, and he had to carry it to the place of his crucifixion. And so those listening to Jesus, when Jesus says to them, if you want to be my disciple, you need to bear your cross, probably the majority of them had seen convicted criminals going through town with a cross on their back. And they knew that that meant extreme sacrifice. A criminal that was bearing his cross had sacrificed his entire life to live a life of crime. And now he was losing it all as he bore that cross and, 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 and ultimately lost his life. And so Jesus is saying to, his, to the crowd here, if you want to be my disciple, you need to bear your cross. You need to be willing to sacrifice and to put everything of yourself aside 
and follow me. And Jesus said, if you're not willing to do that, you can't be my disciple. Now, I've read that passage for years. And I've always read it and asked myself a question. How could Jesus say that? How could he say that? Doesn't he realize that when he says that, the majority of the crowd are going to go, they're going to disappear. They're going to, they're going to leave. And doesn't he want crowds of people to follow him? Why, why, would he, why would he give a message like that? As I thought about that, I thought, you know, he answers that beginning in verse 28. He says, which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? Whether he has enough to finish it. Lest after he laid the foundation and was not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock and say, this man began to build and is not able to finish. Jesus said, you know, here's the reason I'm, I'm saying this. Anybody that's going to build something, first thing you have to do is sit down and figure out what it's going to cost. If I'm going to build a, a, a tower, is the example that Jesus used, but if, if I'm going to build a tower, I need to know, can I afford it? What is the tower going to cost me? And if it's going to cost me $100,000, I can't start it unless I have $100,000. Otherwise, I'm going to lay the foundation and I'm going to start to build and guess what's going to happen? All of a sudden, I'm going to run out of money. And then everybody driving down the road is going to look and say, hey, what's that? And they're going to say, oh, that's a tower that Larry started to build that he ran out of money and couldn't build. Now I'm going to look stupid. And so Jesus said, no, you'd be foolish to do that. Nobody does that. And then he, he goes on and he, he, he shares another illustration. He says, or what king goes out to make war against another king and doesn't first consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who has 20,000? <clears throat> what king is going to lead his people to war knowing he's outnumbered? And knowing he can't win. Anybody going to war needs to stop and consider, okay, I've got this many troops. And they've got this many. How am I going to go to battle? And if I go to battle and I haven't counted the cost and I lose, then, then what's going to happen? I'm going to be embarrassed. And I'm going to suffer tremendous loss. And so Jesus is, is giving these principles so that, that we as well might consider the cost. That we might consider what it, what it costs to be a follower of His. Jesus was not looking for half-hearted followers. Jesus did not want those to start to follow Him and then fall away. Jesus wanted people that were committed to Him. People that wanted to follow Him and put Him first. And wanted them to, to change their lives. I was thinking about that this week. <coughs> Excuse me. I was thinking about that this week. And I thought, you know, do we as Christians sometimes do a disservice to those that want to, or that, that ask us about being a follower of Christ? Do we sometimes give a different impression of what it means to follow Christ than Jesus did? And, and please don't misunderstand me. But as I thought about that this week, I thought, you know, how often have we said or have we heard people say, anybody in this room that wants to be a follower of Christ, repeat this prayer after me, and if you really mean it, you're now a follower of Christ. Have we ever said that or heard that? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus painted a different picture. How many times have, have people been told, well, just, just attend church, and that'll make you a follower of Christ, or give money, or try to live a clean life? And then, when we do that, then later on, we have another question that we beat ourselves up with all the time. We wonder, why, why is it that all of these people that claim to be followers of Christ have fallen away, and nothing really has happened in their lives? Their life hasn't changed. Their heart hasn't changed. They're still living the same way they always lived. They're not serving the Lord. They're not doing anything. Why is that? What happened? And, and so we wonder and we beat ourselves up. And we forget that Jesus said, put me first. 
You want to be my follower? You want to be my disciple? <coughs> Put me first in your life. Take up your cross. Give everything that you have. And then, and only then, will you be my disciple. Now, did huge crowds of people follow Jesus? Not after hearing that message. But you know what? The few that did turned the world upside down. Because Jesus changed their lives. He changed their motives. He changed their hearts. He changed how they lived. He changed how they looked at things. He changed everything about them. Now, again, I always fear of being misunderstood. I am not saying this morning that salvation comes into our lives through works. I am not saying this morning that, that we are saved because of how we live our lives. Scripture very clearly teaches that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And that when we place our faith in Him and receive Him as our Savior, that He saves us. We don't earn it. We don't work for it. It's not something that we deserve. It's not something we could ever earn. It comes about by faith alone. But, if our faith in Jesus Christ lacks a radical change, then it's not faith. <coughs> Excuse me. If it lacks change, if our faith lacks commitment, it's not faith. The Bible talks about that as well. James says, you say, I have faith. Well, what does he say? You can't show me your faith unless there's works that back it up. Unless there's change that goes along with it. And so we're saved by faith. But we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ that changes our lives and makes us new. A faith that commits our hearts and our lives and our everything to Jesus Christ. That is saving faith. You know, as we close this morning, close with just a simple question. This morning, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Is he first in your life? Do you sacrifice to serve him and to live for him? You know, we often ask a question, you know, how do I know? How do I know? You know, we all come to intersections in our lives where we have to make a decision. And we have to make a decision of whether we're going to follow Christ and do what we know is right, or whether we're going to follow what we want and do what we think is right. How we know where we're at is what decision do we make? Do I put myself first? Or do I put him first? Do I put Christ first in my life or do I follow my own wants and my own desires? Who is first in our lives this morning? And again, it's easy to say the Lord is. Well, let me ask you this question. What was the last thing that you sacrificed to please God? What was the last thing that you sacrificed in your life because you were a follower of Jesus Christ? And, and you know, sometimes we can't answer that because we don't know. And, and what does that say? If we're not willing to sacrifice, if we're not willing to bear our own cross, I'm not saying it. Jesus said, you can't be my disciple. You're not a follower of mine. And, and I think that that's why so many, according to Jesus and Matthew, are going to one day stand before him and hear, I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't have a relationship with you. I've never changed your life. You've never put me first. You've never exercised that kind of faith. <coughs> this morning, are you and am I a disciple of Jesus Christ? Is he First, are we willing to sacrifice to live for him in what he says? Let, let's bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, there are difficult things to, to think about this morning, difficult things to listen to, and there's no question that many of the multitude that stood that day and listened to Jesus teach these things. 
bowed their head in shame and walked away. And yet, Lord, those that accepted, those that came to him by faith and committed their lives, turned the world upside down. It's not much later than this that those looking at those, those disciples are saying, what, what happened? What changed? Lord, I pray that we would look at our own hearts and our own lives. Lord, all of us are going to stumble. All of us are going to fall down at times. We're all going to make the wrong choices at times. And we thank you that you are gracious and merciful and willing to forgive us when we do that. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to look at the long haul of our lives. And to ask ourselves whether or not we are committed to you. And whether or not you are in very first place in our lives. And Lord, I pray this morning that if we see that you are not, that you would help us to step back and to evaluate where we are and to commit ourselves in faith to being a follower of yours. Lord, as we are following you, I pray that we would see you working, that we would see you changing us, that we would see you changing others through us, and Lord, that you would be pleased with our lives.